and it's pretty near become a mountain by now with the hope of God's people. You think Moses had hope about flying away and be at rest. What about us? Huh? Beside that, he's given us heaven to go to heaven in. That's a pleasant arrangement. Today, we are very happy to have Brother Harold Key with us. And he's twice brother to Brother Roy Key. He's a kinsman according to the flesh, as Paul would say. Uh, but more so, he's a kinsman in a family whose ties are not broken by the last enemy that should be destroyed. Now, this also is the first opportunity I've had of meeting Brother Harold face to face, although we've spoken with one another frequently over the phone. Always a pleasant experience. There are some people that I really had rather not tell our experiences in communication. It would be best not to do it, but here is an individual I have no reluctance at all to divulge any and every conversation we have ever had. They have all been centered upon God and Christ and the great hope of glory, and it's with joy that I ask Brother Harold to come now and minister to our hearts. You understand I'm a fill-in. I'm a stand-in for someone else. And, of course, I'm sure that you came expecting to hear from Brother Burton Thurston. And I hope you're not so terribly disappointed that he is not here, although I'm sure that all of us realize that we're experiencing a loss by not having him to share with us what he would have shared if he were here. And I'm sure that we all would certainly want to express our regrets at his illness that keeps him from being here. And we would all want to join in in sincere prayers that God will strengthen him and deal with him in that way which, which serves the Lord the very best. Because that will serve Brother Burton too the best. Uh, I was under the impression before coming here, now I got a copy of the program in the original mail out, but I didn't think I would be here, and after keeping that for about a month, I don't know what I did with it. And uh, in talking with Brother Giving on the phone, I thought he said Wednesday morning. Of course, I get things mixed up. I'm not going to say he made a mistake because he doesn't make mistakes. <laughs> but my wife can tell you I do. <laughs> But anyway, I thought that I was to speak this morning and Roy was to speak this afternoon. And here I am again, stuck behind him. <laughs> All my life I've been stuck behind him. <laughs> and behind the others that follow me. The only thing I can hope for is that you're sleepy enough from lunch that uh, you can drowse peacefully along and say amen at the appropriate times and <laughs> everything will go well. But the spirit of singing may have wakened you up. No, really, I do want you to listen. The song, one of the songs that we sang just a while ago, I had never heard before. I don't ever recall having seen it or heard it. Totally unfamiliar with me, but... I don't know whether these songs speak to you or not, but the second stanza of this song is what I decided that instead of what I would be praying to God, that this expresses more succinctly the prayer that I have. Lord, be glorified. The second stanza, I'm changing just the word from song to talk. In my talk, Lord, be glorified. Be glorified. In my talk, Lord, be glorified today. Now, Brother Given didn't tell me that I wasn't to read a manuscript. So whatever you see that others of you feel a restraint by or compulsion for I'm not under that 
<laughs> Let me ask you, please, to bear with the, the messenger. Maybe this is why Brother Given chose me rather than some of you who could probably do it much more competently in speaking on this subject, that he wanted the exceeding beauty of the message of the Lord to be seen and not, you know, just the vessel. So he chose one very plain. <laughs> Remember the words of 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Justification as the general theme of this gathering is being looked at by different speakers in its various aspects, and no doubt much of it overlaps at many points. But hopefully at the conclusion, each will have so complemented the others that we'll have a unified, completed view of justification. But whether or not that happens, I have no doubt that every one of the speakers is proceeding upon the assumption that the title for what I have, and that is that justification is an act of God. I think we are all in agreement on that. I'm sure we're also in agreement that justification is impossible under the old covenant. The old covenant is that covenant that was based on law keeping. Now it had a certain number of laws attached to it, but the principle of it, the basis of it, was law keeping. Not only does the Bible tell us that justification is impossible under that kind of a covenant, but our own conscience, at least mine does, confirm that that is true, and I suspect that yours does too. Each of us knows from experience that, as Scripture says, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Not just God's Word, but God's glory. The glory that He Himself has in and of His own nature and the glory that He intended for us to have when He made man in the image of God, we have all sinned and fallen short of his glory. You and I both know from experience what Scripture says in Romans 3, 19 through 20. We know that whatever the law says, it says to those under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous, that is, justified, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Amen. Now, that's a principle that's true in every phase of psychology as well as in every phase of theology. Through the law is the consciousness of sin when we know right from wrong and we know that we fail to do the right, there comes that consciousness. Whenever we suppose that our being accepted by another person is conditioned of doing what is right in that person's sight, what happens when we make even one little slip? The faux pas that I make, somebody once told me that, that that's a fancy word of saying slip, violation of etiquette. You know what it is to be in someone's home and you, you're wanting so much to have the approval of the host or hostess and you find out that you've done something that's a taboo, <laughs> that, you know, that, that doesn't happen there. And then immediately, regardless of everything else that we've done, which has been correct, what looms largest in our mind? The slip, the violation of etiquette, or even worse, 
because we know that that's what the other person is thinking about. And so that looms large in our minds. Regardless of all else that we've done rightly, that slip becomes, to that extent, a barrier between us. Now let's take that principle up a little higher, a little further. The more exacting the one whose approval that is wanted, the greater becomes the barrier when the protocols of rightness are transgressed. And this principle works both ways. When someone violates our sense of rightness, what happens in terms of our attitude toward that person? Isn't this where alienation comes in? Distance is put between us. The greater the sense of the wrong, the greater the barrier. The greater the sense of wrong, whether it's on my part toward one who has wronged me or on the part of the one whom I have wronged, the greater becomes the barrier. Lest we not think that this is a point worth taking, what is our thoughts about the situation in the Middle East, in the Persian Gulf, where United States citizens are being held hostages? Does that not create a sense of alienation, a barrier? The greater the sense of wrong, the greater the degree of the distance between us as far as any sense of reconciliation? The very fact that we have standards of right and wrong in any direction that we want to apply those, the greater that we feel for right, the more abhorrent that wrong is in our mind, the greater the, the barrier becomes when that right and that wrong become violated. Now take this up and apply it to our relationship with God. You see, we all are so fallible. And our sense of what is right and our understanding of what is wrong is almost as nothing compared to the absolute righteousness, the absolute holiness, the incredible perfection of God Almighty. This is why no one can be justified in His sight on the basis of our really doing, fully and completely doing what God has said should be done and not doing what God has said should not be done. Every one of us has violated that standard of righteousness. The more conscientious we are, the more aware we are of the ever-mounting barrier between us. The greater our sins seem to us, the more earnestly we try to do the will of God, the more conscious we become that we fall short and the more sensitive we are to our shortcomings. This is the inherent weakness of the law as a means of justification. Now, the human spirit just simply cannot endure this conflict continuously. To escape the condemnation that comes from measuring ourselves alongside God's own perfect righteous nature, to escape the condemnation that comes from this, the tendency is often to water down God's requirements. To water down the absolute demands of His holiness. To weaken the standard by which we measure ourselves. And so the inclination is to do as people have done in all ages, 
to devise something as a substitute for God's own nature. And so we can call it a plan, or we can call it steps, or some other vague and innocuous system that we can even call Christianity. It just becomes an intolerably excruciating experience if we keep trying to go on in that desperate condition that ensues when we take seriously the demands of God's own absolute holiness and righteousness. And this is what happened to the Apostle Paul. The entire seventh chapter of Romans expresses the anguish and the despair of such a tormented soul. After agonizing over the battle between the higher and the lower natures that he saw within himself, Paul puts into words the frustration that's felt by all of us who know God's holiness and our own powerlessness to live up to it. Scripture says, the words of Paul, really the Holy Spirit moving Paul, we know that the law is spiritual. But I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. And then he draws upon a very vivid image. According to A.T. Robertson's in his word pictures of the New Testament, he points out here that in that day, the barbarians who were coming down from the north, and one of the reasons why they were called barbarians, that their soldiers, as they went through, leave, left on the battlefield, living prisoners, tied, bound, face to face, body to body, arms to arm, legs to legs with corpses. And they left them until the decaying putrefaction of the dead killed the living. Now, if that's the case, then I think we can understand Paul's conclusion of the seventh chapter when he gets to that expression, Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this bondage to death? I have this desire, but I can't perform. I am bound to this dead and deadly lower nature. 
Who will deliver me? Who will set me free? But then the very next words resolve the despair. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is the power. There is the one who can set me free. There is the one who can resolve this dilemma which would be hellish indeed if there were no hope. Amen. Jesus Christ our Lord, thanks be to God through him. Not only is God the one whose holiness we have violated, but he is the only one who can relieve our unholiness. We are powerless to undo our guilt. Do we agree with that? I don't mean just intellectually, but I mean emotionally. I mean down within our heart of hearts. Do we understand what our lips confess? There is nothing good that dwells in me. I have no power to cancel one sin that I've committed. I have no ability to undo any violation of God's holiness. I cannot go back and retrace my steps of rebellion. I am left only upon his mercy. I have no other means unless I retreat into the insanity of self-righteousness. Only by the conscious and deliberate intention and intervention of God only by God himself assuming my guilt and my powerlessness, my helplessness. Only by his action can the barrier be removed and the rupture of our relationship restored. Amen. That action on the part of God himself which justifies the ungodly is spoken of in Scripture in different metaphors. Different terminology, all referring to either in part or whole of this action on God's part. It depends upon that aspect which we want to emphasize or which the scriptural writer wanted to emphasize. In the New Testament scriptures, it is sometimes spoken of as the forgiveness of sins. And will you forgive me if I don't footnote every one of these expressions? I sh I'm assuming that all of us recognize these as biblical terms. The forgiveness of sins sometimes, and sometimes it's described as saving sinners. Or again, it is redemption from the curse of the law. Or still again, it is justification by his blood. And still at other times, the metaphors are just strung together, such as in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Forgiveness, redemption, salvation, justification. All of these are different terms for describing some aspect of that self-same act on the part of God which he did in the person of Jesus Christ, his Son, our Savior, our Lord. Amen. It is that act of God. It is that act of God himself that forgives the sinner, which saves the lost, which redeems the enslaved, which justifies the guilty, which restores the fallen into right relationship with God who is the source of one's very being itself. Now the good news in our gospel of reconciliation, of forgiveness, of justification, 
of salvation, by whatever term that you express it, the gospel includes it all, and the good news is that as far as we're considering today and in this series of presentations, is that justification, that is being declared right with God, is not an achievement on our part at all, but it is the merciful act of God himself. As scriptures declares in Romans 4, 5 through 8, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Here in this one passage, we have used as an equivalency in terms five things, justifying the wicked, crediting righteousness, forgiving transgressions, covering sins, not counting one's sins against him. And all of this is the action of God toward the wicked, toward the unrighteous, toward the sinner. It is not and never could be an achievement through the effort of the sinner toward God. Amen. People have always instinctively known that only God can forgive sins. Even the blind man could say that to the learned Pharisee. Are the, so, he, you know, I don't know where this man's from, but God doesn't hear a sinner's prayer. I think I got my, somebody correct me there as far as the illustration of the, the one who, who realized only God could forgive sins. I believe that was the Pharisees themselves, wasn't it? Yeah. But through the incarnation of God's perfect word of righteousness into human likeness, and that word being Jesus Christ, only by God's incarnating himself into human likeness and willingly assuming all of mankind's guilt. Through him, God has acted so as to be just and the one who justifies the man who has faith in Jesus. Romans 3.26. The leading idea in the term justification is a legal one rather than an ethical concept. It is not an ethical infusion. It's not that. It's a legal declaration, a way of regarding, an imputation. It is the declaration by Jesus to the woman who was taken, quote, in the very act of adultery. When he had said, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone. And they all began to, one by one by one, from the oldest to the youngest, to go away so that finally the woman was left alone with Jesus only. And he asked her, woman, where are your accusers? Does no man accuse you? And she answered, no man, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. That was a declaration of justification. Amen. Amen. And this is what justification is. It is the one against whom we have sinned, who says because he himself has acted, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. It is to be put right in God's sight. 
This is justification. Justification is the equivalent of God's pronouncing of not guilty. It is the not reckoning of sins. It is the no condemnation. Justification is the legal and formal acquittal from guilt by the Lord God Almighty who is the sole judge. It is an act on his part which puts away the cause of condemnation and reckons right standing with himself. It is his action which removes the barrier and establishes fellowship between himself and the one who is justified. Justification is such an act that it has to be grounded in the very nature of God himself. Titus 3, 4 through 7 declares, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. The scriptures which speak of justifying the ungodly also clearly set forth the instrument by which God does this. The gospel, the very gospel, is simply the recitation of that act of God by which he justifies sinners. The gospel is the story of how the incredibly holy God was incarnated in human flesh in order to reveal the righteousness of God. He was incarnated in Jesus Christ in order to show us what God is. He was incarnated in Jesus Christ who was crucified and raised from the dead in order to show us what we were intended to become. God shows himself to us in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, he shows us as what we will become. Amen. And he shows us who now represents us before himself. In Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. Amen. In Jesus Christ, we stand perfectly before God now. Amen. We are given a standing with, G with God in Jesus Christ, which is equivalent to that of Jesus Christ himself. Amen. That's why there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Our only child to come to birth had full standing our, in our family from that moment from that moment of November the 28th 1948 at 1036 p.m. Nothing that has happened since that time has increased that position. That was a given now, thank God she has grown. She's not only grown physically, she's grown intellectually, emotionally, spiritually. And what a joy it is to have fellowship with her. What a delight she was then. But how different it is now that she is mature. But what I am saying, she was accepted as fully into the family from the beginning as she ever will be. This is what it means to be put right with God through Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that God condones the weakness, the immaturity, 
As a matter of fact, if our daughter had remained the size and the level of development of that precious little newborn child it would no longer have been a delight but have been the greatest sorrow that we could have borne or at any level of her life that that had been arrested. What a sadness it would have produced. But the relationship the givenness of being in our family would still be there. But the fellowship would be damaged and thwarted. The potential would not have come about. And by the grace of God, it will keep on developing and growing under such incredible levels in that age to come that Looking that way, I use the language, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that the Lord has prepared for those that love him. We get a glimpse of them. The foretaste now, if that's so wonderful, what will it be when we reach that level of development that God is creating in us as we grow in the likeness of him who now represents us fully and perfectly and completely before the throne of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21 states, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And here, in, in, in language that I don't understand, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. I think I'm growing in grasping something of that, but I know it's beyond me. The mystery that I can only stand in awe and adoration and thanksgiving. So let it be clearly understood that faith, which is simply trust in Jesus Christ, who is the one through whom God has acted, this faith is never, never, never to be regarded as work or any kind of action on our part that makes us acceptable to God. It is merely honest response to the news of God's act. It is the acceptance of his verdict of not guilty. Faith is the sinner's personal appropriation of God's redeeming work in and through the act of Jesus Christ. Disbelief is nothing less than rejection of what God has done in Christ Jesus. How unspeakably tragic it is to hear the story and then repudiate the truth of what God has done for us. This repudiation can be done by denying that God indeed was in Christ and thereby rejecting for oneself the efficacy of his atonement. I think this is easily seen and recognized in the non-Christian world or on the part of the non-Christian world around us, but a less visible and highly dangerous unbelief can and does exist within the professing Christian fellowship. For the truth of that story can also be repudiated by a mistaken impression that still somehow we're made right with God on the basis of what we do for 
are toward God. And how sad it is that some of the most sincere, some of the most sensitive, some of the most conscientious Christians do this very thing. They read the few but highly suggestible words that James wrote, employing the word justify, and then use that to set at naught almost everything else which is said directly or indirectly in the New Testament scriptures about justification. The writings of Paul, of course, have the most to say on the subject. But it's not limited to the writings of Paul. The doctrine of justification by faith is implicit in every epistle. And it's so sad that the Holy Spirit's carefully developed exposition of justification is so completely dismissed for all practical purposes. For example, this is the case when the illustration is used of Abraham's being justified by faith without works, which is the whole of the fourth chapter of Romans. And then someone contradicting what the scripture has just say, stated by saying, we know it can't mean that because James 2.21 says Abraham was justified by works when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. And James 2.24 says that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. But these same people would most strenuously object to the accusation by an enemy of Christ by saying that the Bible is untrustworthy because it contradicts itself. Isn't that right? But brothers and sisters, if Paul and James are using the words faith and justify in the same way, then there is out and out contradiction. If we find that conclusion unacceptable, then we have to face up to the fact that they're using those terms in different ways. I may be too simplistic, but it seems to me that the difficulty is so easily resolved when we realize, when we realize that James in talking, is talking in terms of, quote, we see. We see that Abraham was justified. And, quote, show me your faith. You see, that puts it in an entirely different perspective. James was not examining work as the instrument are the grounds of right standing with God, but simply how one's faith and one's justification are evident to others. Many, if not the majority of Bible scholars, think the epistle of James was written sometimes before the epistle to the Romans. You know, Paul may, may very well have been acquainted with the epistle of James. Indeed, it's almost as if he were aware of a distortion of James' reference to Abraham when he stated, what does the scripture say? What does it say? And Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. If Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. And then he goes on to develop throughout the whole of Romans 4 the doctrine of justification by faith using Abraham's trust in God before he offered Isaac at the, as the point at which righteousness was accounted to him by God. It was at the point of Abraham's, quote, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And the scripture goes on to declare, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were not written for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Romans 4, 21 through 25. Many Christians apparently never realize that they are not living under grace, 
as long as they expect to be justified by the keeping of law, and that means any law, any law. Even their very language betrays a certain kind of bondage as they refer to, quote, the new law and the old law. I think it is evident that they have not really searched any concordance or they would have discovered that such expressions are not found anywhere in all of Scripture. This is the use of extra-biblical language and it is employing an anti-scriptural concept. They speak of being under the new covenant and indeed they think that they are. But the new covenant, which is a very valid scriptural term, is not a new set of laws having replaced an old set of laws. The old covenant made at Sinai said, here are my laws. Keep them and I will bless you. Break them and you will die. That's the old covenant. And that's the principle of justification upon the basis of law giving and that's why that no flesh will be justified in God's sight upon that basis. The new covenant that Jeremiah said, Jeremiah 31, 31, is not like the, or will not be like the old covenant at all. It will be an inward covenant which is written upon the heart as over against tables of stone. The new covenant, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. The new covenant was made at Calvary. Here is my son. Receive him and live. Reject him and you will die in your sins. The old covenant and the new covenant. But my brothers and my sisters, the only way in which one can possibly say that there is a new law is only when the person of Jesus Christ is internalized. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's Christ's own nature. For me to live is Christ. When we have died to Christ and God's Son has been born within us, We've been born anew from above. Now we are under a new covenant. And we are indeed in that sense under a new law because it is no longer anything less than the law of God's own nature as revealed to us in Jesus Christ. The law which is at work within my daughter that makes her of my flesh and my blood. To those who would insist that our acceptance by God is conditional upon our work, to whatever degree, rather than simply believing and relying upon what God has already done for us in Jesus Christ, His Son, to all of these I would ask this question. Through your way of attempting to gain God's approval, do you really know the forgiveness of sins? Do you really know that assurance of right standing with God now? Do you know the, the peace with Him that passes all understanding? 
Do you really rest in your confidence of no condemnation? Do you confidently rejoice in the security of your salvation? Or do you have a nagging uncertainty? Do you have some lingering misgivings? Do you have any doubt of your present right standing with God? Can you most heartily say, Come, Lord Jesus. All this is cleared away when we realize that our right standing with God is His gift to us, growing out of His very own nature, is based only on what He has done for us, not on what we have done for Him. In conclusion, let me attempt to sum up what I've been trying to say and to some degree illustrate the point that I'm trying to make by telling you about where I grew up in North Alabama, there was a family of three sons. The oldest son was five years older than the youngest. Five year difference between them, but there was so much more difference between them than just the years. The oldest was extremely sensitive to right and wrong. He seemed to be always much more conscientious than the youngest. He always worked harder. He always seemed to feel that he had to be good enough to deserve a place in the family. He was much more studious than the younger brother. From an early age, he was greatly concerned about religion whereas the youngest brother was only slightly so. He would borrow books about doctrinal matters, reading debates and church papers. Often he would awaken at night with terrifying nightmares that it was judgment day and he was lost. Although he learned much of the Bible, he still could not feel good enough to deserve a place either in the earthly family or in the heavenly family. On the other hand, those matters were not a big deal, not of great concern to the youngest brother. He never read church papers or debates or doctrinal issues. He never seemed to be troubled about such things as Judgment Day and matters like that. From his birth, he was with his father a great deal. He just enjoyed being with his father. There was a very close and loving relationship. And nearly all the time, except when there was gross misbehavior, he felt reasonably secure in the family. The oldest brother thought the younger was spoiled and lazy, and that was probably true. But there was a special relationship between the younger son and the father. For example, one of the daily rituals was when the father would come home for the noonday meal before going back into the fields, that he'd take a short nap on the floor and the youngest son would take a comb and just lightly comb the father's hair. There were other things like that that contributed to the bonding between the youngest son and the father just some special pleasure from being together. And that closeness continued until the father died at the advanced age of 87. But as they grew up there in Alabama, both, both brothers attended the same church and the same schools. Five years later, the youngest followed the oldest to the same junior college in Tennessee and then to the same college in California, where at that time the oldest was doing his graduate work. There, both of them then married, lived in the same dormitory one year, and in the same house off campus the next year. But they were never really very close. It was only after the older son went to Alaska as a missionary, and there became a father himself, 
It was only at that period of his life that he came to realize fully on what basis one is accepted into the family and came to accept himself as being in God's family. Since those days long ago, both have experienced many trials. There have been times when the trials were so great that they were each sustained only by the sense of the fathers, the heavenly fathers, abiding presence, and unbreakable love. In the darkest days of their trial, they, they drew greatly each from the other upon his faith. And they found that faith to stand firm. The oldest is still the most studious, still the most conscientious and sensitive and the hardest working. He knows in a deeper way a fuller dimension of what justification is all about. This morning, you and I had the privilege of hearing him speak out of the depths of his own struggle to come to this awareness of what justification means. My brother, my sister in Christ, justification is the act of God. We are justified by his act. We're not justified even by our baptism. We do not, we must not say as Martin Luther did, who wrote that when Satan comes, I reply, I am baptized. We must reply, Jesus Christ has died for me. That is the basis for our sense of right relationship with God. We are not declared not guilty by what we have done, by the, but by the one who takes the hurt and the anguish into his own bosom and says, I love you and I will not let you go. My faith looks to my representative before God. And each time I confess anew my righteousness, my representative, he is my peace, my joy, my hope, my assurance, my all. Now my heart condemns me not. Pure before the law I stand. He who cleansed me from all blot satisfied its last demand. Here is a most appropriate symbol with light coming from behind the cross. A symbol of that real cross which took place on a given day at a given spot upon this earth, but which is the eternal cross that your sin and my sin create constantly in the heart of the Father who loved us.